Welcome to worship today on our online service on June 28th, 2020. Um, thank you for being a part of this. As, as we experimented last week with doing in-person gathering and online gathering as we're going to be doing for a while, you know, I kept track of who was watching and tried to interact and tried to do these things, but it's kind of hard to lead worship and do that at the same time. I know you all understand, but I do acknowledge, and even those of you who don't comment, I can see who's there so just so that you're aware we appreciate everything that you're tr doing as a part of first baptist church and we know it's difficult as you try to balance safety and gathering and freedom and support speaking of freedom and responsibility which is what i should have said next sunday i'll be preaching a sermon that a writing team did i obviously i'm a part of that process but a writing team did many many years ago entitled the united states of america and we will look at where christians should find themselves between freedom and responsibility this might be a good time for us to try to remember that in these circumstances in case you're feeling you miss out because you don't get to see my smiling face in person um, next week i will not be here my smiling face will be on video for even the people who are gathering in person so just so that you're aware of that um, if you want to keep up to date on anything we're doing these days, check our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and our website. We're using a Squarespace platform website now, and so just so that you're aware of that, it may have different things on it. And almost all of the YouTube videos are linked and connected on that page. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Claudia. She's going to play for you, and then I will come back and pray. Let's pray. Holy God, we come to you in these unprecedented times where we wonder what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. And we just ask that you give us guidance. You help us today as we worship, whether we're worshiping here in person or whether we are worshiping in our homes or in the many places that we are. Thank you that we have the privilege to do this and help us remember that we should be worshiping you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So love the world that he gave his only son that he so ever believes will not perish they shall have eternal life and I 
shall hold to the cross I shall hold to God alone for his love has salvaged me for his love has set me free for God so love the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes will not perish they shall have eternal life and I shall upon the Lord and I shall wait upon his word and by his grace I am released by his grace I am redeemed for God so love Whosoever believes will not perish, they shall have eternal life. By His gospel reading for today in tradition is from Matthew chapter 10 verses 40 through 42. Um, in kind of a modified version of sacred reading today I'm going to read the text to you and then I'm just going to read a section of the text and I'm going to read that four different times for us to reflect four different ways upon the text. Then I'll leave a little time for for you to pray as we just try to lean into the scriptures and remember some traditions of worship that we've kind of forgotten through the years. Let me just read Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives a cup of water, and may I be more specific, a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. I'm going to focus through the reading and read it four different times and Ask some very simple questions, give you a little bit of time in between where you can pray and reflect, because this is what we should do. These words that were written down were written down. Yes, they are inspired, but they were written down by real people at a real place who invested literally a, a, almost a life savings 
just to copy portions of these texts not because they thought they were inspired and not because they thought we might be reading them 2,000-something years later, but because they knew they were true and they were helpful. I'm going to read verse 42. And I'm just going to read a small section of it. Now, there's a lot of talk about reward, and there's a lot of talk about we're getting our reward for doing these things. I just want us to listen carefully to a section that we might overlook. Verse 42, and whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple. Standard sacred reading question is, what's happening here? Let me read it again. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple. So what's the meaning that, that we should be getting out of this? Does it matter that it's a cup of cold water? And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple. So what do we think this meant to the people it was originally written for or read to? Does it matter that they didn't have refrigerators? They didn't have ice makers? Does it matter? And what does that tell us? Last time, let me read. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple. A precious commodity, a cup of cold water when there was not ice, was not refrigeration, to a little one. What does God want me to do with that? I think that is our question for today. Let me close this prayer section with our time of offering. Obviously, that text lends towards how we should give what is valuable, and it's an act of worship, and that reward should not be neglected and should not be taken away. Let me lead us in that prayer, and obviously we're giving in different ways. Those of you who are listening to me in person are turning in your, your money in the back of the area. So as we'll say safe, many of you who are not are sending it either electronically where your bank sends a check to us or you bring it in or you mail it in, all of which is appreciated in this process and act of giving. Based upon all that, let me lead us in a prayer and then we'll have an offertory played. And then I'll come back and set up the hodgepodge of Joseph information we will have for the rest of the worship. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you that you are the Almighty, that you are more powerful than we can even imagine, and that you ask us to be a part of something bigger. You ask us to be a part of something in which we can truly make a difference, even if we can only see a little bit of it. Thank you we have the privilege to give back to you, Thank you that you care for us and love us and you showed us by living and dying and rising the dead for us. And you show us every day in ways that we miss so often. Help us to realize in this 
in this pandemic environment that we have opportunities to share a gift of cold water. Now, it may not literally be cold water, but it's going to look like different ways than it did previously and help us not to miss those opportunities. Thank you, Almighty. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Back by popular demand, we're going to show the last of the Joseph videos from the Kids Bible Theater. And after that, then there'll be a portion of the Joseph video from Eyewitness Bible Study. It's been recently published. It's same people who produce the Bible Studies uh, dramatic monologues that we've been using in our Wednesday night program and some of our Sunday worship services. Um, and then I will come back and speak and hopefully tie this together and try to tie together all of the thought process of what Joseph's life and what we can learn to move forward through crisis. Let me turn it over to the catchy music of Bible, Kids Bible Theater. This is a 66 picks mixed up into one. The book's about God, who he is and what he's done It's the Holy Bible, y'all, with God's truth packed out inside It's a life of Christ to hide in your heart and in your mind Old Testaments are set up for the big event When Jesus crashed the scene with a new arrangement It's history, his story, whose story, God's story Oh, the story of how much he loves me Let it blow up So Joseph went to jail and stayed there for more than two years. 
Still, God was with Joseph. One day, the king had two dreams that nobody could figure out. Two guys in the jail got fired from Pharaoh's palace and had crazy dreams one night. God told Joseph what the dreams meant. Pharaoh's waiter had a dream about grapes and juice. It meant that he would get his job back. Whoa, that's cool. Pharaoh's baker had a dream about a basket of bread that some birds ate. It meant that he would be put to death. Whoa, that stinks. Unfortunately for Joseph, Pharaoh's waiter forgot to tell Pharaoh about his dream reading buddy Joseph. Until now, that is. What did Pharaoh dream? Seven fat cows. Then seven skinny cows came and ate those fat cows. Whoa, seven fat stalks of grain waving in the wind. Then seven shriveled up stalks of grain ate those fat stalks. Whoa, what could these dreams mean? But what do they mean? What do they mean? Suddenly, Someone who just got out of jail remembered Joseph and knew he could interpret dreams. Joseph was quickly brought to the palace. Okay, Joseph, explain. Um, well, I can't explain, but God can. He'll tell the dreams to me, and I will explain them to you. And it happened just like that. Pharaoh told Joseph about the dreams, and Joseph explained that there would be seven years of good weather. Hey, that's great! And then seven years of bad weather. Oh, that's bad. What do you think we should do? Move to California? No. What you should do is find someone who's really smart, who can save up food during the seven years of good weather, so that no one goes hungry during the seven years of bad weather. Huh, great idea! Say, what are you doing for the next 14 years? Me? Well, um, I live down at the jail, you know, so uh, I don't have a lot going on right now. Great! You got the job! Sweet! Thanks! Some sayings you have that speak of people like me. Born with a silver spoon in my mouth, born on third base and thought I'd hit a triple. Privileged bloodline, or as they say, a trust fund baby. That was me. Born wealthy, favored son to a rich daddy. I had everything, except one thing, humility. <laughs> God would grant me that gift through mistreatment by my family and the long years as a slave and prisoner that followed. Joseph finds out that his brothers hate him so badly that they are willing to kill him or sell him into slavery. Their hatred leads to Joseph becoming the most influential man in Egypt, a man who was chosen by God to save his country and his family. My first big break came when my brothers threw me into an empty well. My second big break came when, instead of killing me, they sold me as a slave to a caravan of foreign traders. And my lasting memory of my brothers, watching them eat lunch while I was hauled off in copper chains. I guess that makes them sound like a bad bunch of guys, but you know, truth be told, uh, they'd endured nearly 20 years of me as the insufferable favored child of our father. I, I made their lives unbearable lording my privileges over them, tattling on them, my special clothes. I even told them of my dreams where they would someday bow down to me. Of course, those dreams were to come true, but did I need to throw that in their faces? So, there I was at the bottom of the well. I prayed to God for two things, that I would remain faithful to him and that I would be the method by which God would fulfill his promises to my forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. God granted me those prayers, but not necessarily in the way I meant them or with the timing I'd hoped for, something you may have experienced in your own life. God did allow me to remain faithful to him by unexpectedly giving me some incredibly useful spiritual gifts. 
and by placing me in some unique situations. The first promise that God fulfilled through me was not one that came to mind at the bottom of the well. One of God's first promises to Abraham was that for 400 years, his descendants would be strangers in a land in which they would be mistreated and enslaved. Well, at the end of that time, they would come out of that country with great possessions. I was the first step in the fulfillment of that promise. What I prayed for at the bottom of the well was God's promise to my forefathers that their descendants would become a great nation. In my prayer, I meant for my descendants to be a great nation. Instead, God meant for that promise to be fulfilled primarily through my brother, Judah. My important role was to protect Judah and make his family prosperous. <laughs> Walking a couple hundred miles in copper chains with little food and water was the jumpstart I needed to gain some needed humility and trust in God. I gained more humility in Egypt. They examined me like a donkey in the public square. Fortunately, Potiphar, the captain of the guard for Pharaoh, purchased me. Funny, thinking your new owner is a lucky break, but that's what happens when you've been um, cut down to size. No matter what the assignment, God gave me great favor to be successful. Potiphar soon noticed that and chose me as his personal attendant put me in charge of his household, and entrusted everything he owned to me. The more Potiphar entrusted to me, the more God blessed him. With me in charge, Potiphar only concerned himself with what was on the menu for his next meal. With all due humility, I was well-built and handsome. Uh, servant girls vied for my attention, but I wasn't interested in them. My master's wife also vied for my attention. Unfortunately, she was rather blunt, invited me to her bed, day after day. Not only did I refuse, I refused to even be alone with her. One day, I was in the house to do my work. None of the other servants were inside, and she accosted me when I wasn't looking. She grabbed my coat and demanded I take her to bed. I ran out of the house, left my coat behind. I guess that was the last straw for her. As they say, hell has no fury as a woman scorned. She called the servants into her room, showed them my coat, accused me of trying to rape her. And later she told Potiphar the same story. He was furious, put me in prison where the king's prisoners were held. Down on my luck. Is that the phrase? Once again, the Lord gave me great favor. I eventually became the warden's attendant in charge of the jail. Two of the king's prisoners were his cupbearer and the baker. They both had a dream, a rather interesting dream, both of them, and they were anxious to have them interpreted. I said that God had the power to interpret dreams. When those words came out of my mouth, I may not have fully realized how my whole world would change, but from then on, I would forever give credit to God. Instead of making myself the center of attention, I, uh, I listened to their dreams and interpreted them accurately. I asked the cupbearer that when he was released and restored to his position as the dream predicted, to please remember me to Pharaoh. I did not ask the baker for anything because his dream portended he would die. He did die, and the cupbearer released, and promptly forgot his obligation to me. <laughs> Back to square one. Two years later, uh, Pharaoh had two troubling dreams, to put it mildly. None of the wise men or magicians could interpret the dreams. Pharaoh was getting angry, a disaster in the making. When the cupbearer finally remembered me, <laughs> Pharaoh had me brought from the dungeon after I was shaved and bathed. 
Pharaoh said that he heard I had the ability to interpret dreams, just as I told the cupbearer and baker. I can't, but God can, and will. When you read that verse in the Bible, it can sound almost uh, cutesy. However, if I made that claim and it didn't happen, I would have been executed. And who knows how God would have fulfilled his promises to Abraham. Pharaoh proceeded to tell me two dreams. In the first, he's standing by the river when seven fat cows come out of the river and graze. After them, seven ugly, skinny cows come out and eat the fat cows, but they remain ugly and skinny. In the second dream, Pharaoh sees seven perfect heads of grain on one stalk. After them, seven thin, withered heads sprouted and ate the first seven perfect heads. Well, through me, God revealed to Pharaoh that these two dreams meant the same thing. God was about to provide seven years of excellent harvest, followed by seven years of severe famine that would overcome the first seven years. Well, the message was provided in two dreams to emphasize that God would do it, and do it soon. Before Pharaoh could respond, I continued with wise advice from God. I advised him to find an insightful and discerning man to take charge of the land and commissioners under him. They should take 20% of the harvest in the first seven years and store it up in designated cities. Well, that grain was to be used to sustain the country in the following seven years. It was risky giving Pharaoh that advice because it insinuated that he was not capable of executing that plan himself. He was humble enough to realize he was not the right person. Looking around the room, he realized that I was the right person, the most insightful and discerning person in the room. Wise because God endowed me with those characteristics. Pharaoh put me in charge of the plan. I was second only to him in the whole country. He gave me his ring, robes of fine linen, a gold chain, and rode with me in the chariot to impart that power in front of the people. He gave me a wife. She was the daughter of the priest. From the dankest dungeon to the second most powerful person in Egypt, in the world. And I'm only 30. I knew it was not through my own power, but from God's grace. I had finally learned the humility that eluded me in my childhood. For the next seven years, I executed the plan just as God told me. I stored up grain in all of the cities of Egypt. We stored so much that we could not keep track of it all. It, it was like the sand of the sea. It wasn't all work and no play during that time, though. My wife and I had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Those names reminded me of my family. My family. Not a day went by that I didn't think of my family back in Canaan. I thought of my father how he loved me so much. I thought of the robe he gave me. It was, <laughs> it was magnificent. Oh, it would pale in comparison to any one of my everyday robes in Egypt, but it meant so much because <clears throat> I thought of my brothers. <clears throat> Some days I wanted revenge what they did to me. Other days, I wanted to reward them. <laughs> Most days, I just wanted to be with them and just be brothers. Every day, every single day, I thought of the promises God had made to my forefathers. I had two sons. Would they become great nations? I had fabulous wealth and armies at my disposal. Should I conquer Canaan and give it to my father and brothers? That was certainly within my power. 
Every day, I ask God to reveal to me what I should do to remain faithful to Him. With my power, there were so many possibilities. But, um, no big revelations came to me. No big dreams. <laughs> Just this message. Keep doing what you were supposed to do. Okay. The good times flew by. And then the famine hit. Not only in Egypt, but in many other countries. As the people of Egypt began to get hungry, they came to me. I sold them grain. When people from other countries came, I sold them grain too. But at a much higher price. People the world over learned, you can't eat silver and gold. By the time the famine was over, Pharaoh owned the vast majority of everything in Egypt. Through God's guidance and my diligence, he prospered greatly. He wanted to reward me, and uh, I knew just how he could do it. Everything has gone to plan, and let's hope that it has. You've watched the Kids Bible Theater video, and you've watched the entire Eyewitness Bible Study of Joseph describing the events that are referred to as promises, the promises that he prayed for in that presentation, what it led to, and how it came to an end. And he finished with the words, you know, I know the reward I want from Pharaoh. We'll get to that a little bit more light in a moment. But just think about this for a second. Who are the people that we most respect? Who are the people that we most admire? They're the ones who have faced the most adversity. They're the ones who have gone through things and they are better afterwards. We respect people who have been mistreated. We wish they hadn't have been mistreated, but we respect them. And we respect the fact they didn't become bitter, they became better. We respect people who have gone through financial adversity that may not even been their fault and they still give money to the needy. We respect people who faced health challenges and haven't given up on life because of it. We respect people who make faith-filled responses to crisis. We wish we could move forward during these crises, whatever it is for you right now, but we always seem to fall flat. In worship, we've been examining the last couple of weeks the book of Genesis and Joseph, and we're trying to learn from his difficulties and his pain. The title today is Forward Through Crisis, or Forward in Crisis, from Genesis chapter 40. And there'll be way more than just chapter 40, but just so you understand, that's where it'll be from. And whenever we read these texts, we must remember the phrase you keep hearing me say that is not original to me. Pain without gain would be a shame. Don't we want to be better followers of Jesus after a crisis? Because if we don't learn from the pain... Following the simple C.S. Lewis classic analogy of a puppy, we are just like the puppy that shakes off the water after the dreaded bath and learns nothing from it and runs straight to the manure pile afterwards. C.S. Lewis taught us that pain is the megaphone that God uses to speak to us. And if we miss the voice being said, it's a shame. I mean, we ponder, what should we have been doing all along? Maybe the reason we are experiencing difficulties as a culture, as a as a family, as an individual, is because of things we should have been doing all along that we're not doing. Because maybe we're simply reacting to the world instead of responding in faith-filled ways. Now Joseph has been going through this for 25 years. And in Joseph, he makes continual faith-filled responses. Remember, Joseph doesn't have biblical literature or scripture to read. He had become scripture. He has no idea that about 3,500 years later, we're going to be reading about him and worshiping worship themes and sermons about him for three weeks. He has no way of knowing this. He's simply doing what he knows he's supposed to be doing as a follower of God. Quick review. This is Joseph's experience so far. He's been kidnapped by his brothers. 
Saul's a slave, not just once, but twice. He's been framed for a crime he didn't commit. He's been imprisoned. And no one seems to be looking out for him. And as we're going to read in the text today, it seems to get worse. He gets hope and he gets pulled away. In spite of all of this, Joseph acts in confidence that God is always with him. The key question we need to ask and keep asking when we look at this text and its original meaning is, how would someone in Joseph's circumstances have responded if they were confident God was with them? How would someone in your circumstances act if they were confident God was with them? This leads us back to where we finished last week. Genesis chapter 39, verse 20. Joseph, master, put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, well, the Lord was with him? Okay, hold on, hold on. The writers of Genesis are trying to convince us that God is with him and everything keeps getting worse for him. Worse and worse and worse. I don't know how anyone could get the idea and think, oh, this is exciting to be with God. I mean, at this point, as the text continues, says, he, meaning the Lord, showed Joseph kindness. If I'm Joseph and you're Joseph, I know what you're thinking right now. God, I, I love you. I appreciate you, everything you're doing for me. Well, actually, I'm not appreciating what you're doing for me. And why don't you take your version of kindness and take it over to someone else? Because... Maybe they need some of it. But the tricky part here is the word kindness we have translated from the original language is the same word, hesed, and I'm not spitting enough in the era of COVID-19 to really convey properly for you what that means. But that's covenant love. That's a constant word that's constantly used within the Old Testament. Joseph sees his relationship as a covenant with God, but... Kindness? Why don't you take your kindness somewhere else? And then, the phrase that throws me off the most, the text continues, it says, and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Oh, cool favor. Because, you know, when I'm thinking of favor from God, I'm thinking of favor with the prison warden. Because when I think of people who have favor with God, I think of incarcerated criminals. Really? I mean, in fairness, some of you probably know some people who were criminals, did a crime, did the time, paid their punishment, made amends, and were better people for it. That's not Joseph. Joseph is getting favor because the prison warden respects what a wonderful person he is and puts him in charge of things. Joseph is completely innocent completely innocent and he's still going through this Joseph doesn't get time off for good behavior Joseph doesn't get a day off Joseph gets no time off he just has favor in the eyes of the prison warden now according to the writers of Genesis a seemingly unrelated event also happens in what we know as chapter 40 the captain of the guard assigned to Joseph. Assigned them to Joseph. Who did he assign to Joseph? The cupbearer and the baker who annoyed Pharaoh. You've heard about this in the, pre in the video presentations that have come before me, so I don't need to tell you about that. And he attended them. And he had been in, after they had been in custody for some time, not a few days, some time, a significant amount of time. Joseph's life is dragging along like he is the Tom Hanks character in Castaway, and he is just out there forever, thinking there is no hope. Verse 5 continues in Ephesians 40. Each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he said that they were 
he saw they were dejected. Okay, hold on. Every time I read this text, I'm like, okay, this seems pretty obvious, but I'm going to let you keep going. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him, why do you look so sad today? And my smart aleck answer always is, duh, we're in a dungeon. Some time ago, we were working for Pharaoh. Now we're in a dungeon. Why do we look so sad? text continues and we both had dreams they answered but there is no one to interpret them now we miss so much in this culture on this concept of dreams now dreams are just one of those things that our brain rests and relax or whatever you want to visualize what dreams do but it's hard to remember in full your dreams you might remember part you might remember some but very very rarely do you remember in full the dreams that you've experienced? That was also true in their time period. But in their time period, in their culture, when you had a dream, this was one of the common ways that the divine, one of the many gods, would be speaking to you. So if you remembered it, it was important. And it was important you found someone who could interpret that dream. In that time period and time periods after that, there were trained people who were paid a hefty amount that all they did was interpret dreams. Pharaoh probably had lots of them. Every ruler had lots of them. Now Joseph, who we already know can interpret dreams, he can dream his own dream and interpret his own dream, and we know because we've read to the end of the, ch the, end of the book how his dreams turn out. And he knows he knows to interpret. He is in a prison as a slave and he has one of the most highly marketable skills of the day. Yep, God's showing him some favor. I mean, that's not what I think of when I think of him favor. Now, here's what Joseph responds to them. Then Joseph says, do not interpretations belong to God? I mean, seriously here, just for a second. The God who has let all these things happen to Joseph. He's referring to God. And he's not referring to the gods, which is what they would have understood. He says, to God. With all the evidence that God has abandoned him, every evidence in his culture telling him God has abandoned him, Joseph says, don't interpretations belong to God? And then Joseph, who apparently has a hard time knowing when to be quiet, says, tell me your dreams. So the cupbearer proceeds to tell his dream, and he tells this really elaborate dream, and, and then as you've already seen presented to you, and then Joseph says, good news, in three days you're going to get out. But I really, really need you to do me a favor. Do me a huge favor. I need to know that you'll tell Pharaoh that I'm here. And that I'm the one who gave you hope. And I'm the one who can help. Because I'm tired of being here. Even with Joseph's faith-filled responses, he does not like his circumstances. His circumstances wear him down beyond belief. Maybe your current circumstances wear you out. Whether it's cultural, whether it's financial, whether it's relational, whether it's health, whatever it is, your crisis that you're going through right now or are going to be going through is wearing you out. And even if you have faith that God is there for you, you're tired of it. So is Joseph. Joseph is sick and tired of this. Now we know from the text that he also interprets the baker's dream. And that doesn't go as well. He interpreted the cupbearer's dream and he said to the cupbearer, you're Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. Please get me out of this because I've told you you're going to get out. The baker's like, oh, this is going to be cool. I'm going to have a good dream. Baker's dream doesn't go so well. Uh, let's just say in three or four days, the baker's no longer on this planet. Doesn't go well. And Joseph tells him exactly that. He's not pastoral and says, well, I'm not really sure what the answer is, but it might mean that um, you're going to lose your head in three days. He tells him, you're going to lose your head in three days. Once again, Joseph has a problem with honesty. 
He tells him he's going to die, and he does. So three days later, Cupbearer returns, Baker doesn't, things do not go so well. Now many of you are wondering when things are going to go better, when things are going to go well, when things are going to make sense. Joseph is given a glimmer of hope. In three days, I'm going to be able to get out. In three days, he's going to go see Pharaoh, and he's going to tell Pharaoh first thing, because I have given him hope and shown him the way, and it's going to be great. Imagine what it was like for Joseph at this point. Imagine. Every time the prison gates opened, he thought it was for him. Every time the warden came to talk to him, who he has now made Joseph second in command in the prison, basically, kind of like Potiphar did in his house. He's thinking, oh, he's going to tell me I'm out. Doesn't happen. We read the mo- some of the most depressing words in the book of Genesis. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. There's no Obi-Wan coming to save the rebel force. There's no Luke Skywalker. There's no Ray. He has been forgotten. No one is looking out for Joseph. But I thought God was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. If this is God's plan, it's a terrible plan. It's not even 12% of a plan. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible plan. Apparently, Pharaoh has some more dreams. And he has some elaborate dreams that no one can interpret. So these are trained people who should know how to interpret these dreams. They have no idea what to say, and they know they can't say the wrong thing, because, by the way, if you interpret a dream and you're wrong, they kill you. This is a principle that you can read about even in the book of Deuteronomy. We read in chapter 41, verse 14, that the cupbearer remembers Joseph finally. And Pharaoh sends for Joseph, and he's quickly brought out of the dungeon, and he's shaved and changed his clothes before he goes to Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. It wasn't an awesome dream, but I had a dream that no one can interpret. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And here's Joseph again. Mr. Honesty, who doesn't say what I would say, he says, hey, you're darn right I can do it. I'm the best there's ever been in interpreting dreams. Give me your dream, I'll interpret it, and then we'll go from there. Or he might have done this. I don't know. How much money is it worth to you, Pharaoh? How much guaranteed pardon can I get if I interpret this dream? That's not what Joseph says, apparently. Apparently what Joseph says is this. I can't do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. After all this time, Joseph is still holding tight to his faith in God. The God he can't see, the God who's done no miracles for him, the God who hasn't sent angels for him, the God he can't even read about in the Bible because it doesn't exist yet. He does that. He's a foreigner in the strange land. And he says to Pharaoh, oh, by the way, in their culture, Pharaoh, who would have been considered to be divine, at least to some extent, a man standing in front of you asks you a question who, th- who the people think is a god, and he may think he's a god. And you say, but God can answer it? So then it goes, you're not a high enough god, but I know one that is. This is Joseph's one chance, and that's what he says. He does proceed to interpret the dream, interprets it the way you've seen presented in the videos. There'll be seven years of of grandeur, and then seven years of famine, which changes the landscape of the entire Mesopotamian area. And then Joseph, not from the dream, from just being the bright individual that God has given him brilliance, says... 
You know what I would do, Pharaoh? Like, you need to be told, because, you know, why would I need to tell a demigod or a god that what, they, what they need to do? But why don't you find someone who's really responsible and put them in charge of this for 14 years? Well, we read that Pharaoh looks at him for a second, ponders it for a second, and according to the text, he goes, that's a really good plan. Now think about this for a second. The people sitting around who see Pharaoh as God, or a God, are like, I can't believe he said that to God. The cupbearer who stood up for Joseph is thinking, I'm going to go right back to prison. You don't talk to the God that way. Remember, in this time period, you don't talk about one God. You talk about all kinds of gods. Even the Jewish people after this, when the Ten Commandments are given under Moses, the way the Ten Commandments are written are written very carefully to reflect that the Jewish people did not believe in just one God. Now they believe Jehovah, Yahweh, God the Father was the greatest of the gods. But they believed in lots of other gods. Feel free to check your Bible later. Exodus 20 verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. Why is it written that way? Unless they believe in other gods. Now we know they do for quite a while. The evidence for this is enormous. Joseph is smashing a belief that even his culture tells him isn't true. Well, this finishes off and we get to what we know as verse 39. And Pharaoh says, since God, so the person considered to be a God, says to Joseph, your God, who must be more powerful, has made all this known to you. Maybe you should be in charge of my country. And we know that that's what happens, and he's in charge, and he does a really good job. And one day he is literally a slave in prison, and now he's the second most powerful person in Egypt. Now before you get too excited and think, oh, this is wonderful, here's what Joseph's probably thinking. Potiphar said I was the second most important person. I know how that turned out. The w prison warden said I was the second most important person. That didn't go so well. At any time, Joseph could have doubted that Pharaoh was, things were going to go well for him. But we know from the biblical text that Joseph worked day and night to make all this happen. And he's the reason that Egypt thrived. He's the reason the rest of the world thrived. And he's the reason so many of these things happen. We read in verse 42 that Joseph's brothers are sent by their dad to go get grain because they've heard it is in Egypt because they don't have any. And they go... Joseph sees them, probably goes through all the trauma of being an abuse victim, and he remembers the dream that he had a long time ago that maybe he should have kept to himself of his brothers bowing down before him, which is exactly what happens. And one more time, Joseph responds with faith. He doesn't react emotionally. He doesn't react like everyone else would do. He makes a faith-filled response. Chapter 45, verse 3. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Now we know they shouldn't have been terrified, but can you imagine the experience? The person they thought was dead or might as well have been dead is now the person they have to depend upon and he's asking about their father. Joseph makes a faith-filled response, does a few things to test them and all these different that would have been common in that culture. And he says, where's my father? And there's some narratives that go along by the father that you can read about. Things are going well, and communication goes back and forth, but then the most horrible thing happens for the brothers. Dad dies. And the brothers kind of had the idea that the only reason Joseph wasn't killing them was because dad was still alive. Well, Dad's dead now. And so they go to Joseph pretty much in terror. And Joseph says to them at the end of, uh, end of the book of Genesis, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? 
Joseph is on the verge of being seen as the Messiah of Egypt, the Messiah of the entire region, the Messiah of the world as we knew it at that time from Western thought. He literally would have been seen as divine based on that culture. And he says, I'm not God. You have nothing to worry about. Now we know, we know from reading the parts of Genesis that I've left out that the favor that Joseph asked to Pharaoh is this. I want to bring my family here and I want things to go well and I want things to be good for them and I don't want them to be bothered for any reason because they look different and act different. Than, and Pharaoh's like, whatever you say, Joseph. And we know that's what occurs. But the famous phrase that is the pinnacle thesis statement of the book of Genesis. It's not in the beginning God created. It's this phrase that you've heard me use before. Genesis 50 verse 20. You, Joseph said to your brothers, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish his work. For the saving of many people. Joseph's sacrifice helped more people than he could possibly even imagine. God's will was carried out by Joseph in spite of the evils of others. Because he responded with faith-filled responses all along the way, and he literally changed the world almost all by himself. So this brings us back to the fundamental question that we need to answer in this pandemic and in all the other things that are going on in your world. How would someone in my circumstances respond if they were confident God was with them? How did Joseph respond? If Joseph was in your place, how would he respond? Because your answer tells so much about you. And more importantly, pain without gain would be a shame. I don't want you or you and me or anyone to go through this and not gain anything out of it. We have to learn what we should have been doing all along. The best way to move through crisis is to make faith-filled responses, not just react like everyone else. How should we respond the next time a crisis happens? Sure, you're going to get it wrong. I get these crisis things wrong all the time. But the more we trust God and make faithful responses based on the power of the resurrection, the more we can be like Joseph. The more we can move forward in crisis rather than feel like we're stuck or going backwards. Because God will never, ever let go of you.
to know you here on the earth And I will feel no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I Let me pray for you, and we'll close the service. Holy God, please be with all those who are listening to me in public right now and all those who are listening online and all the ones who listen later as they deal with crises that are beyond what I can even imagine. Help them to feel your presence and help them to know that you've never, ever let go of them. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Next week, we'll look at freedom and responsibility. Hope you enjoy, and maybe you even get to experience a July 4th weekend this upcoming weekend. Thank you.